Hi everyone. In this video I wanted to show you how it is possible in SPSS to generate regression results with robust standard errors. And the reason why this topic is important is that one of the main assumptions associated with least squares regression is that of homoscedasticity. And what that refers to is a condition where uh, the variances of your residuals are uh, equal or consistent across levels of your predictor variables. And so in those cases where this assumption is not met, which is also referred to as heteroscedasticity, then in that case uh, what that means is that the fit of your model is essentially varying across levels of your predictors. So in other words, your model is not behaving the same way across levels of your predictors. And so this can translate into increased type 1 or type 2 errors when you are interpreting your regression coefficients depending on the nature of the violation. So if we can obtain uh, a set of standard errors that are robust to this violation, then we can feel more confident in the inferences that we draw regarding the predictive relationships in our model. Now before we get started, I want to mention that underneath the video description you will find a link to the SPSS data file that you see on your screen so you can download the data and follow along. Additionally, I will include a link that I've found on the web to this article by Hayes and Kai uh, entitled uh, Using Heteroscedasticity Consistent Standard Error Estimators in OLS Regression. So, this uh, article provides a really good discussion of the use of robust standard errors and it also provides a nice reference in case you want to um, incorporate it into any write-up of results where you are referring to the use of robust standard errors. So let's go ahead and go back into our SPSS data file and what I have right here is fictional data from uh, 425 students and what we're going to be uh, running is a regression analysis where we have uh, predictors anxiety, mastery, interest, and engagement. These variables are going to be predicting uh, student achievement. So we'll start off with just running a standard uh, uh, multiple regression in SPSS by going to analyze, go to regression, and then go down to linear and we'll move our dependent variable achievement to the dependent box and our predictors will move them over into the independent variables box. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, or any detail for that matter, uh, on various options or uh, our determining whether even heteroscedasticity exists. This video is only with respect to the issue of um, how to obtain those standard errors. So we're going to go ahead and click on OK and take a look at our output. So you, you'll notice that with respect to the model summary table, there's our R square value. So we would interpret that to mean that our predictors are accounting for about 23.4% of the variation in achievement. The F test and a P value that's given right here uh, would lead us to infer that the population R square is greater than zero. And then when we scroll down to the regression coefficients table, you'll notice that we have our unstandardized regression coefficients. Um, so you'll notice that we have our intercept as well as the regression slopes for the predictors below. We have our standard errors and then we have the t-values that are given and uh, there's our uh, column of p-values. Now the t-value, uh, the t-values are found in this column are formed as a ratio of the regression coefficient to uh, their respective standard errors. And so the reason why this is important is that when we are generating our robust standard errors um, through the other route that I'll show you shortly, then what that's going to mean is that the t-values and the p-values are going to be adjusted for uh, the presence of, of heteroscedasticity which is exactly what we want to occur. So um, just really quickly, just taking a, a quick look at the individual predictors, you can see that anxiety is a negative and significant predictor of achievement. Uh, we have mastery and engagement. Both of these predictors are positive and significant uh, predictors. And then we have interest. We have a positive predictive relationship, but uh, it's not statistically significant. 
Now let's go ahead and go back to our um, our data here and we'll go ahead and run our analysis and request our robust standard errors. So to do this we're going to go to analyze general linear model and then go to univariate and so when this box opens up you probably will recognize this as a box that we typically use when we're uh, performing a standard uh, analysis of variance like a one-way ANOVA or a factorial ANOVA or ANCOVA. So to do our to obtain our regression results all we need to do is to move the achieved variable to the dependent variable box we'll move uh, anxiety mastery interest and engagement all the way down to the covariates box and next under options when we click on this we can ask for some of the usual things that we might ordinarily ask for but I'm going to focus in uh, by asking for parameter estimates right here and so by clicking on parameter estimates I'm going to get uh, a table that essentially contains the regression coefficients um, that we saw previously uh, when we ran our regression through uh, the previous route. Additionally, to obtain my regression coefficients with the robust standard errors, I'm going to click on this button right here and we'll click on HC3 which was actually the default. So we'll click now on continue and then on OK to take a look at our output. So the first thing I do want to mention is, is that you'll notice that with the corrected model, we get the F value and the P value that we saw previously with our regression, um, our previous regression. So uh, those are exactly the same. You'll see underneath it says R squared, which is 0.234, there's the adjusted R square. So we can report the R square and the adjusted R square as these values, which is exactly the same as what we had seen before when we looked at our, or when we generated our regression results. So again, there's the R square value that's given up here, there's the adjusted R square, there's the F value and the P value uh, that were given right there. When we scroll down, you'll now see that we have our parameter estimates table. So you'll notice that we have our unstandardized regression coefficients. This uh, column right here contains the standard errors, which we saw before with our regression table. So both of these two columns are exactly the same as what we had generated previously. There, uh, we have our column of T values and P values. All of these are exactly the same. If we had requested confidence intervals uh, previously, uh, we would have the same results that are given right here. The only results that you do not see, obviously, are the uh, standardized regression coefficients or the beta coefficients. So if you want to obtain those, we would have to run uh, our analysis through the other route to get those. But nevertheless, you'll see that down below we have our parameter estimates with robust standard errors. So you'll notice that the regression slopes that are given in the B column, these are exactly the same as what we had before. The difference is now instead of having our standard errors where we are assuming homoscedasticity, now we're obtaining our robust standard errors adjusting for the presence of any um, heteroscedasticity uh, in our residuals. The T values obviously then are going to be adjusted. So this is uh, you know prior to adjustment, and then we have our T values following adjustment. And then the P values that are given in the SIG column right here, these are adjusted. So these values are going to uh, differ from these values that are presented right here. And then finally, uh, you'll notice that the 95% confidence intervals that are given below are uh, looking different from those that are above and that's again reflecting the fact that we're using the robust standard errors down here instead of uh, the standard errors that would be assuming homoscedasticity in the uh, results presented above. Okay, so uh, and one final thing that I thought I would show you is uh, really quickly if we go back uh, back under univariate and go back to options right here. I do want to mention I, I, I said before we wouldn't talk about a diagnosis of possible heteroscedasticity, but there is this little section in um, under the options for heteroscedasticity tests, and so you'll notice that we've got uh, this modified Bruch Pagan test, the Bruch Pagan test, an F test, and White's test that are given right here, and these are all different tests that theoretically, if you were in the process of trying to uh, identify p potential um, heteroscedasticity, then these are um, 
these are uh, approaches that you can use to test for possible heteroscedasticity in your residuals uh, and then use that as an uh, additional information on top of any kind of graphical approach to um, looking for potential heteroscedasticity. So I do want to show you really quickly that um, for instance we can click on this modified Bruce pagan test click under model right here you have a couple of options you can either use the predicted values or use the individual uh, regressors in your regression model uh, I'm just going to go and stick with use predicted values right here um, you also see that we have this uh, White's test right here. The reason why uh, White's test is included uh, on top of this modified Brush Pagan test is that, you know, basically the Brush Pagan test assumes um, if there is, a, it, it's essentially modeling a linear relationship between your predictors and the variances for your residuals. So uh, I'd mentioned earlier on, I kind of as a side note, I mentioned about. Uh, the, that the effect on type 1 or type 2 error sort of depends on the functional relationship between um, your predictor variables and uh, the variances for your residuals and so this test right here and this one here and obviously this one right here these actually all suggest a linear functional relationship uh, whereas White's test actually considers the possibility of nonlinear functional relationships between your predictors and the residuals. So White's test is a little bit broader uh, but it essentially involves more um, uh, regressors in the model uh, than those other two. But I'll show you really quickly just with these two tests right here what what the output would look like. So if we run our uh, model right here you can see we have uh, down here we have this modified Broch pagan test for heteroscedasticity and it's non-significant so conventionally we would refer we would uh, suggest that at least uh, based on this test that there's no evidence of any kind of linear functional relationship between the predictors and uh, the variances of your residuals. However, with White's test, it actually does turn out that we have statistical significance here, which would suggest uh, a potential nonlinearity between your predictors um, and um, the uh, variances of the residuals. And you'll see in terms of the design right here, you've got uh, just to show you what I meant by the inclusion of additional terms, you can see we have anxiety, mastery, interest and engagement all of these are kind of our first order terms and then we've got uh, anxiety by anxiety so the square of anxiety then we have anxiety by mastery anxiety by interest uh, and then and so forth and then you'll see we have mastery by mastery so you can see we're adding in the square of that variable here and then obviously down here we've got the square of interest and uh, the square of engagement that's uh, added along with uh, the interactions with all the other variables so that's why I was saying that it includes a lot more um, uh, predictor variables in the model than these other models so at any rate uh, that's going to kind of wrap up this demonstration and uh, I appreciate you watching